Thank you, David. And um, let me just check whether you can hear me at the back. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to preface my presentation by expressing my gratitude for being here in Ireland. My grandmother was Irish. I owe a lot of my faith, I think, to her, and particularly to the fact that she prayed a rosary every day of her life, um, except at the end of her life, when she prayed three rosaries every day. <laughs> And she was an uh, extraordinary tower of strength for the faith. And I, like many English Catholics, we owe so much to Ireland. Uh, I can't um, begin to, to, to calculate the, the impact on my own life of good Catholic priests, of good Catholic sisters, of the influence of, Catholic Im uh, of immigrants into England who've helped to, to renew our faith. And I thank you uh, on behalf uh, of, of all of us who've been beneficiaries of that. The title of my talk this evening is The Alleged Conflict Between Science and Faith. And um, as David mentioned at the beginning, this is not my main area of interest. I'm really interested in the philosophy of persons. But the challenge of our time is that it is alleged that there is a conflict between science and faith. And indeed, this is one of the main battlegrounds in what are called the culture wars. So it's important that we are able to respond so my talk um, this evening is going to be co come in four parts. Um, first, to make some necessary distinctions. God, philosophy, religion, and faith. All these things tend to get a bit confused in people's minds, and a lot of uh, apparent conflicts can be resolved by careful definitions. Compatibility. Can one be a person of faith and of science? A value. What does faith do to help us understand the world, if anything? And then finally, if faith is beneficial, how can we help faith to do what it's meant to do? Well, first of all, I have to challenge a popular narrative which is now very prevalent uh, in our culture. And what I have to say from the outset is a belief that there's a God belief that there's a God is not unique to the religious. Now, um, I still can't get over my excitement when I first went to seminary, and for the first time, um, I was taught the history of Western thought. I had studied to doctoral level in physics. I had smashed particles in Geneva. I had done all kinds of computer programming, and no one had taught me how to think. <laughs> no one had actually introduced me to philosophy. And then for the first time, when training to be a priest, you see, the church is like an arc of Western civilization, and it teaches these things that we've forgotten in many other walks of life. And the church began to teach me philosophy by introducing me to the Greek classics. And I opened the books of Aristotle and Plato, who are not Christians. They're pagan writers looking at the world. And to my great excitement, I saw they're talking about God. Um, for, for Plato, God is the form of the good. He's like represent, represented by the image of the sun. For Aristotle, he's the unmoved mover that puts everything else into motion, that causes without being caused. So these great figures, these towering intellects, the founding fathers of Western civilization, Western, much of Western thought, they were talking about God. Now, this itself is important. Because the narrative that we're taught today is that if you believe in God, you must be somehow intellectually inferior. You must be somehow a bit stupid, right? Well, um, don't worry. If you believe in God, you're in good company. You're in company with Plato, Aristotle, Anselm, Aquinas, Aristotle, Newton, Descartes, Kant, almost every person of note right up into very modern times. And it's, it's debatable whether modern times have produced many persons of note compared to these figures. <laughs> so, you see, and this fact is, is obscured by the new atheists who generally argue and probably want to believe that theists are generally primitive, irrational and evil. Well, some theists are primitive, irrational and evil, but that's clearly not the whole story with all these great minds talking about God. Um, you know, it's a theme I'll return to later. It's, it's not the question of whether God exists, it's what God is. That's a more interesting question. 
Now, um, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the works of the New, new Atheists. Um, and this is actually a change in my own lifetime. When I was uh, an undergraduate at Oxford, um, to be a Christian was to be nice but stupid. Um, so there's a famous um, uh, radio interview by Ludovic Kennedy, an atheist broadcaster for the BBC. Uh, surprise, surprise. And um, Ludovic Kennedy was, was um, interviewing a rabbi. And the rabbi was taking a very hard line on something. And um, uh, Ludovic Kennedy said, isn't that rather an unchristian attitude, rabbi? <laughs> you see, at that time, to be Christian was kind of ni nice in a slightly wet way. Right? Um, but the narrative has changed, particularly the last 10 years or so. Um, Christianity is increasingly seen as a problem by those constructing the brave new world, at least an irritant. Um, and we are portrayed as being a problem um, or even evil. And uh, this is expressed by actually an atheist himself, Julian uh, Bagini. Um, Militant atheists tend to make one or both of two claims that moderate atheists do not. The first is that religion is demonstrably false or nonsense, and the second is that it is usually or always harmful. So, in fact, this is the line that a lot of people are now taking who would count themselves as uh, intelligent. Now, um, it's important uh, for anyone getting involved in this to know that there are all these resources answering the new atheists. Um, sorry. So, oh, so, uh, sorry, another point first. And I'm, I'm grateful for, to David Quinn for this because he came, came to give a talk to us in England some years ago. And he pointed out that um, there's nothing new about new atheism. So, uh, here are some of the old atheists. And... Um, you see here on the left, this is um, the membership card of, the, of um, uh, which, which belonged to those who were joining the Communist Party, the Young Communists, and they had to join the League of the Militant Godless. So if you wanted to enter the, the route to, to, to power and, and position in communist um, uh, Russia, you had to join the League of the Militant Godless between the late 1920s and 1940s. And there, in fact, is one of their magazines. You see Jesus being thrown out of a wheelbarrow while they build the brave new world in the background. Sounds familiar? Um, this is the same narrative. So we see the same narrative being um, recapitulated in the modern age. And militant atheism really was militant in the 20th century. Um, that's the largest orthodox church in the world being dynamited um, uh, in 1931. It was actually rebuilt <coughs> in the year 2000. And, and here is... Um, an article, uh, Article 37, of the People's Socialist Republic of Albania in 1976. The state recognises no religion and supports and carries out atheistic propaganda in order to implant a scientific materialist world outlook in people. So aggressive militant atheism is nothing new in the world. It has been tried and tested um, in the lives of millions of people over large expanses of our planet. Uh, incidentally, by the way, um, if you fly into Albania today, you fly in, into Tirana International Airport, and it's at the Mother Teresa International Airport. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you a few uh, responses, there are all kinds of uh, all kind of literature. I encourage you to, to read around and, and get, uh, learn um, uh, responses to, to the new atheism. Um, a friend of mine, Thomas Crean, uh, wrote a Catholic replies to Professor Dawkins. And then there's The Dawkins Delusion by Alastair McGrath, who he's always a, he's always a, gives a very um, uh, insightful and humorous insight uh, responses. And then there are various other books, um, like um, New Proofs of Existence of God by Robert Spitzer, uh, Stanley Yarkis books, and so on. Now, this issue is not purely academic. It's influencing social policies in ways I'm sure that you're familiar with, and we're certainly familiar with in England. And here's an example of uh, a debate in the House of Commons in the year 2008. And, and the debate was over the subject of whether or not it will be permissible to try to create animal-human hybrid embryos. Uh, so the debate was whether we could try to create animal-human hybrid embryos. And this was a very typical um, kind of um, argument and this was by um, one of the MPs, throughout, this is the MP for Bolton South East, throughout time there's been a conflict between religion and science. Now that was, that was the line, but basically he was saying, if you're against this attempt to create 
animal-human hybrid embryos, you're against science, and you're with all these ignorant religious people. And that was, that was the line that was taken. Incidentally, what does the House of, um, what does the House of Parliament look like? Yes, um, some people are saying uh, they look like a church, and of course that's exactly right. Um, uh, our, uh, the House of Parliament um, of the United Kingdom were actually um, inspired by Catholic medieval architecture, particularly its work of Sir Charles Barry and, and Pugin. And um, it's quite fascinating that um, our parliamentarians in my country um, actually meet in a, in a building inspired by Catholic civilization, and they pass all this bad legislation. So, um, we'll look briefly at uh, proofs for God's existence. Now, I can't possibly go through these all tonight, but I just want to make one point um, clear, because you'll sometimes be told that there are no proofs for God's existence, or you'll sometimes be told that those proofs have been discredited. And I have to tell you, this is not true. You know, within the world of philosophy, these proofs are still being reformulated and debated, and many people hold them um, to be correct, or some of them to be correct. There are cosmological proofs, proofs from degree, anthropic proofs, moral proofs, transcendental proofs, and so on. So, uh, again, belief in God is very much part of intellectual play. It's part of uh, an acceptable position for um, someone well-trained in philosophy. I should add, however, that although proofs are important, um, of, of this kind are important, that's not often what, what moves people. What moved me as a, as a scientist and uh, someone particularly interested in, in, in a more amateur way in, in mathematics um, was this sort of thing. You know, when, as a physicist, a mathemati mathematician, you get to sort of look at the, at the foundations of things. And it's awesome. Um, this is something I really love this. This is the Mandelbrot set. It was discovered in 1978. It can be mapped by means of computer. It goes on forever and it never repeats itself. And it's beautiful. We didn't create it. Um, we explore it. And there's lots of this wonderful stuff lying around uh, in creation. And um, it doesn't exactly prove God, but it gives us a sense of religious awe. It certainly gave me a sense of religious awe. It's the sort of thing Augustine was speaking about when he said, their beauty is a confession. Now, I must anticipate an objection here, because a lot of people will say the universe is disordered and ugly. And certainly, as you go up to more complex beings, you get a certain amount of disorder. You get sort of obviously a lot of order, but a certain amount of disorder. Um, if you like, we, we live in a disheveled garden. Um, but that's what you'd expect if you lived in a universe created by a loving God, but, but a loving God who had, that had allowed um, spontaneity and freedom and voluntary action, and hence a certain amount of disorder in the garden. When you go down into the deep level stuff, the physics and the mathematics which founds it all, you see, if you like, God's primary um, uh, architecture. Wait, what, what disorder are you talking about? I'm sorry? What disorder are you Oh, a disorder, I'm talking about the sort of things like um, uh, the problem of suffering, um, the problem of death, the problem of decay. Sorry? I don't see a disorder. Okay. Do you mind if I just hold the questions till the end? Although I'd love to pick, you up, on, I'd love to pick up on this a bit later. Thank you. So only because I've got so much to get through for the moment, but thank you. Um, so the Mandelbrot set, and this is, uh, you know, it's a center of beauty with these things. By the way, I often jokingly refer to this as God's wallpaper, so you want to know what God's wallpaper looks like. Right? <laughs> but there's another reason why I think um, a belief in God keeps coming back, and that's because of the nature of causation. And the, and the word cause uh, is an answer to the word why. So if you ask the word, if you ask the question why, the first response is because the cause of the being of a thing. And when, we, when the human mind starts to look at the world and asks for the cause of the being of things, we tend to get a kind of funnel effect. We start on the left-hand side with lots of particular things. Um, like, for example, in material reality, we start with compounds. We get then down to elements. We get then down to subatomic particles. But you'll notice that going from left to right, you get a much smaller number of more powerful causes. And this is the passage from knowledge to wisdom. Knowledge is on the left, wisdom is on the right. It's the stuff, it's the universal causes. And it almost doesn't matter what you start with. So, for example, you can look at the actions that we do as human beings during the day. So washing and eating looks after the body. 
um, uh, studying looks after the mind, and um, uh, say having lunch with friends, and all these things look after our society. But why do we do these things? Why do we study? Um, why do we look after our bodies? Um, why do we look after our society? Why do we do these things? Any thoughts? I, well, now, supermarkets know this, by the way. So I go around the supermarkets and I look at the packaging, which is actually one way in which people are introduced to philosophy in daily life. And I once found um, a, a packet of biscuits offering me snacking nirvana. And I found um, a cheese, um, sorry, a, a yogurt called Bliss and a cheese called Heaven. I said to the lady selling it, you, we are, you, we're both in the same business, obviously. Um, <laughs> except you're probably making more money than I am, right? <laughs> but you see, the supermarkets know all human beings seek happiness, right? And they're offering you eternal happiness in a biscuit. And by the way, choosing to use religious language to sell, that's another matter. Um, so, so again, you get a kind of cause funnel. And when you see a funnel like that, what's the first natural question to ask? What's at the end of the funnel? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why God keeps coming back, because... We need something at the end of the funnel, right? And, we, and the real argument is, is only over what God is. Um, <clears throat> my own favourite proof, the cosmological proof, um, it's, um, there has to be... A, everything we, we see around us, every, everything we perceive, doesn't cause itself. There must be something which causes all those things without itself being caused. Basically, in summary, that's a cosmological proof. And various attempts to get round this don't really work. Um, if all the causes go in a circle, um, that itself needs explanation. And another way of thinking about this, if you think of the universe like a, like a, uh, like a house built on a foundation, no matter how deep the foundation goes, there must be some point at which it stops. There must be a, a foundation which causes, which holds everything else up. Without that foundation, there'd be no house. Now, here's a quotation um, I'd like you to tell me where, where you think it might come from. So, millions of flowers on the earth tell us his love. Blue waves of the ocean sing of his work. He's the creator of happiness. Millions of flowers on the earth tell us his love. Blue waves of the ocean sing of his work. He's the creator of happiness. What kind of context would I see those words? What kind of situation uh, might you sing these words? In church, perhaps, yes. Maybe it's a not, not, not a very well-written hymn in a church, yes? Okay. As I'm sure you realised, it is, of course, the second verse of the National Anthem of North Korea. And the last line goes, Long live, long live General Kim Jong-il. So you see what's happened. In North Korea, by the way, um, many religions are effectively banned. Um, uh, there, is, there is one Catholic church allowed in Yongyang, and we cannot appoint a priest. You cannot hear mass anywhere in North Korea legally. Right? Millions of people are living in slavery in North Korea. North Korea has abolished belief in, trans in a transcendent God. Not a particularly good advertisement, by the way, for atheist societies. But what has happened in North Korea? Do you see what's happened? They've transferred the worship of God to something else. You see, if you abolish belief in a transcendent God, you create a job vacancy. And it will be filled. We've, done the, we've run the experiment 26 times in the 20th century, and we always ended up with something like this, right? So as Catholicism, uh, sorry, as Ireland says, oh, well, maybe we won't be Catholic anymore, right? Sorry, you don't end up with something, right? And that's why I think the, the battle over faith is not just about faith. I mean, my main job as a priest is to get people to heaven. I, it's, a, it's a supernatural goal. But saving civilization will be kind of nice along the way, right? I don't want to end up with people like this, right? Okay, so religion and faith. So believe in God's existence and the question of religion overlap, but they're not identical. Um, religion involves a lot more than, than um, 
uh, belief in God. It involves worship, traditions, ritual, other elements. Now, a lot of people will say that there are many different religions in the world. It's all very complicated. But most religions fall into one of three categories. Um, I, I like to divide them by how they treat the person of God and the relationship to God. So um, Buddhism I always describe as a no personal religion because there's no personal God. And there's nothing in it that's, that's really... Imp- the idea of a personal relationship to God isn't a theme, a major theme in Buddhism at all. Islam's a funny case. It's, um, it's what I call third-person relationship to God. And it goes along the following lines. Um, the Surah 331, If you love Allah and obey his prophet, then Allah will love you. If you love Allah and obey his prophet, then Allah will love you. It's, it's a, a commutative transaction. You do this for Allah, Allah will do this for you. It's... Um, it's like, it's like a commutative, it's a commutative transaction, third personal. Now, that's actually quite a, a natural way to think about God. It's often how people begin thinking about God. But the goal of Christianity, and you also see it in the narrative of the Jewish people, is towards second person relationship to God, loving with God the things that God loves. And you can see this by the change of grammar. So Aristotle, writing three centuries more before Christ, he says, God is good. Um, God is perfect, God is eternal, he never addresses God as you. And seven centuries later, an equally brilliant intellect, St. Augustine, is writing in these kinds of words, late have I loved you, beauty so ancient and so new, late have I loved you. Um, It's as if the human race has lost its spiritual autism in relationship to God. If you want a, want a, a metaphor for what grace has done in the world, what the coming of Christ has done and the grace brought by Christ. It has taken away our spiritual autism and brought us into an I-thou relationship with God. So faith, I would describe as the root virtue of a second person relationship to God by grace. Okay, faith and science, are they compatible? Well, let's have a quick look. So um, who is this gentleman? Everyone, sees, everyone knows who Einstein is? And I'm sure you all know who this is. Some people do know. Do some people not know who this is? Right, okay, good. I'm still adding value. Good. Okay. Um, This man is Georges Lemaitre, and he's famous for what? Big Bang Theory. Theory. Very good. Yes. Um, It's still a surprise to many people um, that um, Georges Lemaitre invented the Big Bang Theory. What was his other profession, by the way? He was a priest. A Catholic priest invented the Big Bang Theory. And, um, in fact, when I go around to schools, I'm often asked, how can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang Theory? I said, we invented it. (laughs) Although this is not a fact that certain people want um, to be broadcast very much. The BBC last summer ran a big documentary on the Big Bang, and they cut out all mention of Georges Lemaitre. That's why you've got to be very careful what comes down that tube these days, because the people putting these programs together can't be trusted or they don't know. Um, I have to admit, I, I did have a long chat to a BBC journalist recently, and she very kindly put in a link to La Metra on, on an article on CERN, so I'm very grateful to her. But, you know, we don't always get the full, the, the full picture. And not talking about La Metra in context of the Big Bang, it's like describing relativity without mentioning Einstein. And he was the father of the Big Bang. What's also interesting is how he was received, how his work was received by the Catholic Church on one hand and by atheists on the other. Um, Father Lemaitre was honoured by the Church. He was made president of the Pontifical Academy of Science in 1936 and a Monsignor in 1960. Doesn't sound like much of a persecution to me. Um, By contrast, as late as 1948... Astronomers in the Soviet Union were urged to oppose the Big Bang Theory because, they said, it is promoting clericalism. <laughs> and that, that persisted for 30 years, for 30 years, right into the 60s. So it's not the narrative people expect. We are told that atheism is the friend of science. And these ignorant religious people, they're the enemies of science. But... History keeps showing us sometimes a rather different story, or at least the picture is more complicated than the naive um, account would suggest. And it is important to know a few other names. Now, in cataloguing these, it might imply that I'm boasting about them. I don't want to boast, 
But I think it's important to know these counterexamples because of this strong cultural narrative. So here's some, some other names that, um, that we ought to know about when we're faced with, with this challenge of the conflict metaphor. So, for example, Monsignor Grigor Mendel, the father of, mo of modern genetics. Um, he, incidentally, he cultivated and tested 29,000 pea plants. Quite an experiment. And, we've, and he's, he's regarded as the father of genetics, which in turn, by the way, helps to feed the world today. Um, the father of astrophysics, Father Angelo Secchi. He developed an instrument for splitting the light from the stars into its um, different colours, enabling us to, for the first time, to study the stars as physical systems, to study their evolution, to group them together. And so he's, uh, he, he warrants the title of father of astrophysics. Father Nicholas Steno, father of stratigraphy. It's, um, so that he gave us all kinds of rules for interpreting the natural history of the rocks. So when you see valleys eroded out um, in sedimentary structures like this, um, you can, the simple rule is the valleys happened after the sedimentary layers were laid down. And with lots of simple rules like this, he gave us the tools to begin to interpret the natural history of rocks. Father Boscovich, father of field theory. Um, he's just, it's one of these figures has gradually been rehabilitated because he's been forgotten for a long time. But if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see a diagram. Now, as someone who's studied um, uh, um, physics, uh, that's, that's a very familiar kind of diagram. That's the sort of diagram you get in a modern physics textbook. It's the idea, it's the modelling of matter like a field, point-like particles interacting um, in a field. But this is 1758. I mean, it's an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily prescient work. Father Rennie Howey, father of crystallography, very important for all kinds of um, uh, Chris, uh, applications and the use of crystals, uh, quartz watches, and so on. Um, his brother was Valentin Howey, the founder of the first school for the blind. Its most famous student was a man called Louis Braille. Um, all, all. Irish should know about Father Nicholas Callan. Has anyone heard of Father Nicholas Callan, by the way? A few, that's, that's good. Um, he worked at Maynooth, and he's, he's a great pioneer of electronics. In fact, they've got a nice little museum at Maynooth about his work. Uh, he invented um, the Maynooth battery in 1854, one of the most powerful batteries of its kind, um, using inexpensive um, cast iron technology. And uh, he also discovered an early form of galvanization to protect iron from rusting. Incidentally, um, he didn't have a very easy way of testing the power of his batteries, so he used to ask the seminarians to touch the live ends of the, uh, of the coils and to measure how high they jumped. And we have from his notebooks that some of the shocks took several days to recover uh, from, so the rector decided that we better, uh, they better stop there. Also, it's important for venting the induction coil, which is uh, a device for, for translating, um, alternating to direct current. All kinds of power transmission systems that we use today depend upon that uh, invention. Now, one uh, accusation that's often made against the church is that we've held back women. So it's important uh, to know some uh, counterexamples to this um, modern myth. And... Um, a famous example is Maria Agnesi. Maria Agnesi, um, her claim to fame, she was the first woman professor of mathematics anywhere in the world, anywhere in history, any time in history. And she was actually appointed by Pope Benedict XIV. And she was appointed to that post uh, in 1750. Now, to put that achievement in perspective, the first woman to get a PhD in mathematics in the United States was not till 1886, that's nearly 150 years later. And she wasn't alone. Um, there are many women uh, academics, uh, particularly uh, associated with the 18th century University of Bologna. But it's very interesting that Catholic civilization will produce um, these pioneering figures. Maria Ignacy um, is famous for writing a book of calculus which became important across Europe uh, um, as an educational tool and some famous curves in geometry. Now, um, before I go to my next slide, I just want to ask you a quick question. When Columbus sailed to America, what was he afraid of? Falling off the edge of the earth. Of the earth. Okay. And where was he trying to get to? Okay, he was trying to get to India. So why, so why do you say he was afraid of falling off the edge of the earth? 
well then, if he thought the Earth was flat, how was he expecting to get to India? <coughs> See, the story doesn't even make sense, does it? You know? No, right? <laughs> now, I, 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 I mention this one because it is very, very widely believed and repeated again and again that if they were so stupid in the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, perhaps, that they were so stupid they thought the Earth was flat. And this is, just, this is a black legend invented in the 19th century, um, and it's particularly associated with Andrew Dixon White, who wrote a, a, a populist book. He was a kind of Richard Dawkins in the 19th century. He wrote a book called The, the History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And this is now widely believed today, and it's a lie. Um, any intelligent person in the Middle Ages knew the earth was round. It's mentioned in the first article of, of St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae. It is also mentioned in Venerable Beads, the father of English history. Um, it's mentioned in all kinds of church fathers about the roundness of the earth. Columbus was afraid. He was afraid that he would starve or die of thirst before he reached the other side of the globe. Uh, but there's a lovely vision in Dante, where Dante's rising up through the circles of paradise. He looks down and sees the globe of the earth, right? So clearly in the high Middle Ages, that's what they thought the earth was like. So where does this flat earth business come from? This is a black legend. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a lie. It's a big lie of our time. In fact, Catholic civilization could, could, lay, uh, could um, lay claim to having given the world modern geography. Because almost exclusively, all the great voyages of discovery were launched by Catholic powers um, or, and Catholic individuals. Uh, so, so Marco Polo, Prince Henry the Navigator, Bartholomew Diaz, Christopher Columbus, Magellan's Expedition. And not only did they go out sailing, but they invented tools for mapping um, their location on, on the Earth's surface and producing the world's first scientific map. And that's the world's first scientific map, Diego Ribeiro's version of the Padron Real, 1529. Um, you know, this is, this is a, an extraordinary achievement of Catholic civilization. The Chinese were pretty advanced. The Ottomans uh, could build fleets, but they didn't launch voyages of discovery. The Gregorian calendar from 1582. Um, not only did we give the world the modern understanding of space, particularly the, also the, the geography of the Earth, we also gave the modern world the measurement uh, of time. And the Gregorian calendar, it's a very great achievement to measure the length of the solar year. And a lot of the work was done by Jesuits, particularly Christopher Clavius. And the, the resultant calendar is named after Pope Gregory the 13th. And the whole world, except Saudi Arabia, follows the Gregorian calendar, pretty much. Now, the challenge, um, you know, we're often told that to be a person of faith, you have to be you know, against science, or, you, might, you know, it's naturally against science. And often the case of Galileo is cited. How did Galileo die, by the way? He died in his bed. His daughter became a nun. I think, he, I think the church, he had to stay in this villa, and the church made him recite seven psalms a week. Well, in 2,000 years, if that's the worst thing we did, that's not too bad. Huh? And actually, the church admitted Galileo was right once the scientific evidence came in. You know, you know, this, if, if that, you know is this this dogmatic evil institution that held back science? You know? And what has atheists done when they've had power? Because they have had power. They don't like to talk about this. Um, Atheist states have held power over millions of people in the 20th century, um, controlling large parts of the world's resources. How have they treated intellectuals? How have they treated the life of the mind? How have they treated science? And look at this. Um, and this is just a small sample of the most famous. Uh, Nikolai Vavilov died in a concentration camp. He was a great advocate of Mendelian genetics. Um, Sakharov um, went into internal exile for opposing the regime. In the Cultural Revolution, any intellectual was an enemy of the people. You know, this is, um, how is the life of the mind favoured? Now, of course, an atheist may say, well, of course, that was just a mistake or an accident. Maybe they'll get it right next time. But, you know, the track record isn't good, and they need to be held to account for this. Okay. Now, I mentioned all those things um, for one purpose only, which is to counter the naive conflict metaphor. Clearly, the relationship of, of, a, of what it is to have faith and what it is to science is more complicated than many people would have us believe. It's a much more complicated interaction. There's no, there's no grounds for supposing a naive hostility to exist between faith and science. 
But I want to just step one, in my final, last part of my talk, I want to just go one step further. I want to see, does faith do something positive for science? Is a mind formed by faith uh, in somehow, um, is that helpful for science or other aspects um, of our world? Now, it's not easy to explore this question because faith doesn't actually give us scientific knowledge as such. Um, and that's because science deals with other sorts of things. Modern science is mainly about measurement, about um, quantitative relations, um, forming the mathematical laws, uh, discovering the mathematical laws we see in nature. Um, faith doesn't do that. Faith is mainly about um, the perfection, the happiness of persons, the relationship of persons with other persons, and of persons with God. There's not much measurement involved in mathematical laws. Nevertheless, what it is to have faith clearly forms the way we perceive the world. And this is, um, this is perhaps more clearly seen in art, first of all, uh, rather than science. So have a look at this sequence of pictures. Now this is uh, one of my favourite pictures. It's um, the Van Eyck mystic lamb. And it's the most symbolically, um, sorry, theologically accurate symbolic picture of heaven I think has ever been presented. And you see the saints gathered in paradise. You see them gathered around the revelation of, of the Blessed Trinity, the incarnate Son of God represented by the Lamb the, um, as a book of the Revelation. You see they set the fountain of grace with the seven sacraments. Um, and you see um, nature perfected. Nature, every tear will be wiped away. Um, nature perfected in the kingdom of heaven. That's the vision of the world, that's the vision of happiness for human beings as seen in the mid-15th century. Now in the 16th century, what's interesting is they started to get rid of the saints. So um, here you see the penitence of Saint Jerome, painted in 1524, and there's a change of emphasis. The saints are much smaller, the landscape's much bigger. By the late, six, by the late 16th century, um, the elements of grace, and grace, by the way, is second, uh, defined as... A, um, that life which gives a second person relationship with God. The elements of grace have been um, largely obliterated. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a sense of a church in the background. But really, what's being admired now is just nature um, without grace. And by the 19th century, this is one of the main themes, particularly in English landscape paintings. And uh, this is Constable's The Hay Wayne. Absolutely beautiful. Um, there's, no, there's nothing specifically of faith about it. Um, there's nothing about supernatural faith, grace, sacraments, saints, anything. There's a slight sense of the very beauty of it giving a, a faint echo of the divine, that's all. But something funny happens to art by the end of the 19th century, and this is Van Gogh's last um, work of art before he committed suicide. And here you see the road isn't going anywhere, and the vertical dimension is collapsing, and we're beginning to lose the... Um, the clarity of, of the beings in the landscape. By the mid-20th century, some works like this are being called art. This is um, Jackson Pollock's Enchanted Forest in 1947. I, I, I do apologise to purists among you. I've turned it on its side. <laughs> now, of course, there are many other kinds of modern art, but this is, but this is part of the canon of modern art. It's part of what's accepted as modern art. Um, and it's interesting, it's almost as if nature, our perception of nature has disintegrated when the grace has been removed. So the life, the faith, the beginning of the life of grace, clearly forms the mind in certain ways to perceive the world in certain ways that are important for culture. And one way of thinking about this is that um, um, faith, if you like, forms um, the context within which we perceive the world. The, the, narr the grand narrative which draws the pieces together. There isn't really a good word in English um, um, for, for this. A word we tend to use in German, the Gestalt. Um, another way of thinking about this is it's the right brain cognition. There's a certain amount of work done these days on the, on the um, complementary work of the two hemispheres of the brain. But um, what we've learned is that if you lose right brain cognition... Um, you lose the gesht out. You, 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 can, you can still draw the details, but they're all in the wrong order. You know. um, the bits are right, but the whole is wrong. And I suggest that a lot of what faith does is form our, our, if like the, the, the grand narrative within which we perceive the world. And I would suggest that, at least in art, that's been a very fruitful grand narrative. So um, 
I suggest that the, the faith for education generally is not just a matter of adding additional facts, except about the matters of faith, but it's, it's giving us the big picture, the context within which we order our perception of the world, a framework within which facts and reasoning can be organised and make sense. But I also think faith shapes indirectly um, all the other things that, makes, that make knowledge possible. It shapes our philosophy. It shapes our view of time. It shapes our education, morals, laws, society, and even whether we have hope. And just looking briefly at these. So, for example, faith, um, Catholic Christian faith has formed the philosophy of the world. Um, we believe, uh, the Catholic view of the world is that the world is a world that is ordered, that the world has causation within it, put there by God. There's a wonderful phrase that Thomas Aquinas gives us, God has given his creatures the dignity of being causes. If causes are in nature, they can be explored um, by, by uh, human experiment and, and uh, investigation. Um, the idea of objective law, the, uh, the idea that the universe is ordered in the first place, um, the principle of non-contradiction, all these things are either things that Catholicism has, has invented or, or adopted from elsewhere and defended. Faith has formed our understanding of the world via time. A lot of cultures don't have our view of time. A lot of cultures have the view of time as going in a circle. And of course, if you're in a circle, nothing ever changes. There's never any progress. Everything that goes around comes around. There's nothing new under the sun. But the news of Christianity is that there is news. There's good news. There's something new in the world. And that's given a direction to time which underpins our very notion of progress. We regard time as um, linear, as going from a creation to a conclusion. And perhaps that's one reason why it was the priest who came up with the Big Bang Theory. It's, it's, a natural way of, it's already a natural way of thinking about the world if you're thinking in this kind of, of, of manner. And of course we've you know, also contributed to the recording of history, um, the construction of clocks, which came out of medieval Europe. We couldn't do science without um, accurate mechanical clocks in the first instance. Faith has formed our understanding via education. You know, I don't see how people can say to um, Catholics or Catholic Church that you know, you're, you know, you've held people back, you haven't educated people. We built the European university system. I, 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 I work at Oxford. Oxford is a Catholic institution. It was founded around the Blessed Sacrament. All our ancient colleges have beautiful chapels focused on the Blessed Sacrament. And the, the very idea of a university as an institution protected by law, as a corporate person protected by law, that comes out of Catholic jurisprudence. Again, an invention of the Middle Ages. And by the end of the Middle Ages, by the by time of the fall of Constantinople, there were 50 universities in Europe. That's product of Catholic civilization. Now, I'm not doing this to boast. I'm doing this to counter what's being said about us. And look at the schools. You know, um, the oldest extant school in the world, um, the school, King of School, Canterbury, founded by St. Augustine, 597. And, and in, in England, we had a, a terrible radical pruning. We had 300 years of persecution. I believe you know something about this in Ireland as well. Um, you know, uh, because, by the way, we, the Catholic Church defended the rights of a woman not to be dumped by her husband... We lost our universities, our lands, our monasteries. Um, uh, our priests were driven into holes. Defending the notion of marriage, by the way. Yeah. And, you know, we had 300 years of being crushed, right? And as soon as we were allowed to come back into public life, we started to build schools. 10% of students in England um, are educated in Catholic schools. And they tend to be oversubscribed because they're better, right? Somehow, you know, even, even many of our atheist politicians want to send their children to Catholic schools, even as they try to undermine and destroy Catholic education. Because you know. <laughs> they give something they'd love to capture. They can't capture it by a secular mindset, but they see it and they want it. Right? Faith forms understanding by morality. We, we're not just about obeying orders. Um, uh, you know, there are religions that do that, you know, just obey. Uh, it's loving with God the things that God loves. That's actually the root of Catholic morality, right? Because we're, we're, 
We're, we become children of God, right? That's, 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 the, that's the extraordinary calling we have as Christians, not to be robots or slaves, um, loving with God the things that God loves. And that's, that's transformed the virtues. There are new virtues in the world, faith, hope, and charity, humility, trust, truthfulness. Faith has formed understanding via law. Um, habeas corpus, trial by jury. Law as a unified system, fiduciary trust, natural and positive law, theory of contracts, agency, representation, objective law, which even the most powerful rulers cannot contravene. We owe the Catholic Middle Ages for these things. And by the way, as Christianity comes under attack in, certain, in many countries today, many of our ancient legal rights are being taken away. Um, one of my ancestors said an Englishman's home is his castle. Well, there are now 266 laws which allow the state to enter, enter a private dwelling in England. Um, you know, there are lots of um, erosions of ancient rights are being taken away, all for the best reasons, of course. And faith has formed understanding via, via society. The modern political mind seems to want to turn society into a machine where um, everything is controlled, all discretionary action is controlled by the state. Um, you see this in the growth of surveillance systems. You see this in the growth of petty regulations over health and safety. You see this over um, all kinds of ways in which individual initiative is crushed. Um, you see this in the centralizing force of the modern state. The Catholic vision is different. The Catholic vision is not that society is a machine, that society is a garden. That's why wherever Catholicism has spread and been allowed to flourish, there's been a rich diversity of guilds, of parishes, of families, of distinct national identities. Um, one of the most fruitful times in European history was the Italian Renaissance. And it was in northern Italy, which was a, sit a set of um, Catholic city-states. Um, all, all kinds of very, very distributed um, kind of society. And we promoted particular political system, um, principles, subsidiarity, uh, and many Catholics promoted the, the economic theory of distributivism. Very different to the machine model of society that's often been given to us. And we've we formed the understanding of the world via hope. You see, if ultimately you end up perceiving the world like this, if you say it all ends in chaos, dust and death, what kind of basis is that for building a civilization, right? On the other hand, if you think in this world we write the title page of what we are to be in eternity, that we've been given this extraordinary privilege of being adopted as children of God, and that even giving one cup of cold water to someone will be remembered um, by God in the kingdom of heaven, then suddenly this life becomes extraordinarily important and we've got hope for the future. So very briefly, uh, last couple of minutes, um, if we assume faith is of value, um, how do we help faith to do what it's meant to do? I suggest the following. We need to draw on 2,000 years of faith-formed genius to communicate that belief in God and a life of faith are intellectually respectable. You know, we've got a tremendous intellectual heritage. We've been given wonderful tools through the internet, through the access to, to ancient records. Um, we need to kind of bring this much more into people's consciousness. We also need to know some basic historical facts. Um, you know, when the challenges are made, what has the church ever done for us? Ha uh ha, -huh. well, quite a lot actually. Um, but we've got to know the stuff, so knowing the facts, very important. And to show the value of faith in shaping our world, especially, uh, I call it organic apologetics, knowing the roots and the fruits of things. And this is what Jesus um, says, you'll know them by their fruits. If faith forms understanding, um, then, uh, then it's really something of a, of a right brain, the, the, the right brain cognition is very important. This is the sort of thing um, Archimedes talks about, uh, says when he, he describes Eureka, when he sees the big picture uh, for the problem he's trying to solve. And we get that kind of formation through images and narratives. So I think images and narratives are very important for, for Christian formation. I, I was told when I was at school, uh, Jesus spoke in parables because he was speaking to rather stupid people. I now know that's not the reason Jesus spoke in parables. He spoke in parables, it's the very best way of teaching. And um, it forms particularly the metaphoric understanding of the world within which the facts can be organised. So teaching the parables of Christ is important. And also the narratives of the Old Testament. A lot of narratives of the Old Testament come alive when their spiritual significance is realised. 
I often remind, uh, tell people that um, the story of Exodus from the escape from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, crossing through the wilderness, fed by manna from heaven, crossing the river Jordan into the promised land, this is the story of a human soul. Crossing the Red Sea is baptism. The manna from heaven each day is the Eucharist. Crossing the river Jordan is a river of death. And of course the promised land is an image of heaven. So it's not just the story of strange things 33 centuries ago. It's also our story. It's a story of a life um, of, of, of a graced soul on, on the way uh, that of God's training towards the kingdom of heaven. Knowing the figures of our Christian history, I mean, there's tremendous resources to draw upon in the history of Ireland. Um, the story of our civilization in the Christian key, Christian literature. I'm immensely grateful to C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, other great Catholic writers, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, and good films. Uh, I, I, I constantly get inspiration from films like The Man Four Seasons, particularly in the interesting challenges that we now face. Um, and the experience of Christian art and its interpretations. You know, we produced the most beautiful art the world has ever seen. We'll kind of let the world know this and, and also teach by means of this beautiful art. Um, we have some resources and we need more. Um, uh, again, not to boast, but to show the fruits of the faith in the world, to the world. And um, how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, Thomas Woods. By the way, there was... Um, a famous businessman in New York, New York who gave um, $27 million to the Catholic schools of New York about a decade ago. And this man was an atheist. And uh, he was challenged about this. Why have you given all this money to, 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 for bursaries for church schools? And, and, what he, and what he said in response was that without the Catholic Church, we would not have Western civilization. So um, I, I produced a little pocket book, um, which is convenient for carrying around, The Catholic Gift of Civilization. When people challenge me, I can just give them this book. Um, what has the church ever done for us? Uh -huh. I think a little humor helps. Um, David's been good at this, um, taking on people like Richard Dawkins. Um, interestingly, da um, Richard Dawkins and his colleagues, they, they ran a campaign in London some time ago, the Atheist Bus Campaign. And the slogan was, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Incidentally, why was, anyone know why the word probably was, ins was inserted? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the Advertising Standards Authority requires you to be able to justify your claims. <laughs> now... Um, Richard Dawkins actually was challenged to a debate by an American um, evangelical philosopher, William Lane Craig. And um, initially he said yes, but he doesn't really like debating with philosophers, by the way, Richard Dawkins. Um, uh, so eventually he pulled out. Anyway, um, William Lane Craig had a bit of fun with this. So um, he ran a bass campaign in Oxford for, for, for a few months. There's probably, there's probably no Dawkins. Now stop worrying and enjoy your, your time at the Sheldonian Theatre. <laughs> so I, I'll just conclude by saying, I'll ask inviting questions. I'd like to know what you think. Um, do you agree or disagree with what I've said? Um, what else do we need? I open the floor to you. Thank you very much.